Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday seminar uh, series. I'm Paymon Jaffery, a postdoctoral research associate at the Sharmin and Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our today's guest speaker, Dr. Mikia uh, Koyagi. Uh, he's an assistant professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Texas. He specializes in social history of modern Iran, particularly issues related to transport and mobility. He also works on the transregional histories of Japanese Middle Eastern interactions. He received his PhD in history from the University of Texas in 2015. His articles have uh, appeared in several journals, including the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, Comparative Studies of South, uh, South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and the Journal of World History. His first book, um, Iran in Motion, uh, was published by Stanford University Press in April, and he is with us today to discuss the development of the Trans-Iranian uh, Railway. Um, I have been a great fan of his work, and even more so after reading this uh, wonderful book. Um, I'm, of course, somewhat biased given our uh, common interests in infrastructures and how they facilitated social and cultural transformations in modern Iran. Um, I will come back to some of these uh, themes during our conversation, but I will first give the screen to Dr. Uh, Koyagi, and uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to write them in the Q&A section uh, so we can discuss them during the conversation. Uh, Mikia, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the generous introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the Sharmin and Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies, and uh, Director Dr. Behruz Ramani Tabrizi for the invitation, um, the Gitar Union for organizing the event, uh, Peach Novak for technical support, and uh, Dr. Payman Jafari for kindly agreeing to engage with the book. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you about the book. Um, so let me share the screen. I have several slides to show. Um, okay. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'm sorry, let me, let me stop sharing that for a moment. Um, okay, so, all right, could I just show the, um, slides this way? It's not as good as uh, it should be, but I think you get the same visual. Am I sharing the slides right now? At the moment, uh, Mikia. Um, try it again. Okay. Sorry. Share screen. Not yet, I believe. I apologize for. No, that's all right, but this. we were seeing it in the beginning when you just started, or was it? Oh, you were okay. Um, you know, it's quite surprising oh. how easy it is to forget all the Zoom uh, technical aspects that we learned There's always something last semester, right? And, and and we can see it now. I think. Um, 
at least at yeah this is I think okay um let's do it like this does that yeah, it, yeah. it's it's fine too it's okay fine. great great i apologize for the slightly less um clear visuals okay so my book um iran in motion uh, it tells stories of socio-cultural transformations in late Qajar and early Pahlavi iran um, by examining a state-led mega infrastructural project. And I specifically focus on the Trans-Iranian Railway um, to trace all sorts of ordinary people's competing um, imaginations and practices of mobility and ask how Iran was produced um, out of contestations over mobility. So to give a brief background information before I get into the specifics of the book, um, the Trans-Iranian Railway was the first long-haul railway in Iran constructed uh, between 1927 and 1938. And although its construction process was supervised um, by, uh, by a Danish consortium, it was the mainstay of the centralization policies that the new Pahlavi state of Iran pursued under Reza Shah. So, as you can see on this map, um, the railway connected uh, two bodies of water to Tehran, uh, the Caspian Sea in the north and the Persian Gulf in the south. And it also went through you know, important places like Qom, the Shi'i shrine city in central Iran, Loristan, a tribal region in the west, and Khuzestan, a resource-rich province bordering Iraq in the southwest. So it touched the lives of many groups, including you know, tribes, peasants, workers, uh, vacationers, pilgrims, technocrats, and whatnot. And given the diversity of the places the railway connected and the diversity of the historical actors involved, I thought the Trans-Iranian Railway Project would be a great lens through which I could write uh, interconnected uh, social histories of uh, early Pahlavi Iran. Um, to explain why I wrote this book, um, maybe it helps to start with a picture like this. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with pictures like this, right? Pictures that feature Reza Shah Pahavi and the Trans-Iranian Railway. Um, the, the famous ones, you know, similar to this include, you know, a picture of Reza Shah tightening the last bolt of the railway track or Reza Shah staring at the hand clock while, um, while waiting for the departure of a train. And we also have pictures like this one, right? These pictures that featured the magnificence of the material structure of the railway. And these pictures appeared extremely frequently in the Iranian press of the period, uh, accompanied by captions that gave technological factoids about the length of the railway, the number of bridges and tunnels, um, the amount of cement used for construction, and of course, uh, praise to Reza Shahab's uh, willpower for making the national dream come true. Um, and a massive material structures like uh, stations, bridges, and tunnels evoke this sense of uh, awe and wonder. And coupled with the repeated claim that it was Reza Shah who made it happen in Iran, um, these pictures essentially legitimized the Pahlavi state, right? Along with visual evidence like stations and bridges, the captions provided um, techno-scientific data to augment an aura of objectivity. And by doing so, articles in the press presented the successful operations of the railway and the subsequent transformation of the nation as a fate accompli. And I wrote my book the way I did because um, I felt like historians' existing understandings of the Trans-Iranian Railway um, accepted some of the fundamental premises of this sort of state propaganda, right? So historians have done so mainly by reproducing the views expressed in official publications. And in most accounts of history, the Trans-Iranian Railway is discussed uh, in the context of political and economic integration of the early Pahlavi period, uh, especially emphasizing the actions of Reza Shah himself, while paying relatively little attention to many other aspects of the railway project, 
So I was really curious about finding out, you know, some basic aspects of the railway, like who were the workers who traveled by train, and importantly, how did the railway system work? Um, and asking this last question um, about how the railway system worked, you know, made me think about a lot of mundane questions like what it meant to operate steam locomotives in an arid country or how railway regulations developed given the popular perception that accidents um, were so frequent. So I ended up writing an entire chapter, uh, which is chapter five, um, about accident prevention measures or various attempts at producing safe and speedy movement, especially after the completion of the railway in 1938, which I think illustrates how the railway system didn't really start functioning simply because the material structure like stations and bridges existed, right? Despite the impressions we might get from accounts that focus on resultless actions. Um, I'm not really saying that focusing on political and economic integration is inherent and problematic because you know, the early Pahlavi period did witness rapid expansion of state power. Um, but an almost exclusive attention to Reza Shah and his state didn't quite sit well with how um, many of my Iranian colleagues and friends talked about the railway. Like giving, giving me really vivid individual accounts of their father or grandfather working for the railway in its early decades. And it certainly didn't convey the complexities that I kept finding in travelogues and memoirs written by you know, railway travelers and workers. But to me, it seemed like not integrating these accounts and privileging official accounts would, would perpetuate the conception that state was the engine for change that operated separately from society, which kind of passively received, reacted to uh, Pahavi era modernization efforts. Um, so with this general framework, uh, my book argues that the railway project was about a massive reorganization of the movement of the nation, both spatially and qualitatively. So instead of simply kind of integrating the nation with Tehran as its uncontested center, the project hierarchically redistributed mobilities. And in doing so, it connected and separated multiple geographies and groups and ultimately produced many Iranian citizens who are differentiated by their practices of mobility. Um, so I should talk a little more about uh, what I mean by mo mobility and why it's important um, in the book. So historians usually use the concept of mobility um, in a macro spatial sense, right? So mobility is often equated with um, travel and migration. And I do use mobility in this sense, but also I use it to discuss more qualitative aspects of movement um, meaning how individuals experience travel and migration as they make uh, micro motions. And to put it more concretely, um, I, let me talk about a pilgrim, pilgrim mobility uh, as an example. So the early Pahlavi state promoted tourist mobility, right? The vacation of citizens to Iran's historical and natural sites to strengthen their attachment to the nation but um, it viewed pilgrim mobility with suspicion, um, particularly a transnational pilgrimage to Mecca and Shi'i holy cities like Najaf and Karbala. And this was the case because pilgrim mobility was often seen as potentially subversive for the nation by creating competing focal points of citizens' loyalty that went beyond national boundaries. Um, but in addition to the destination and the purpose of travel, there were other reasons why pilgrim mobility seemed so problematic. And that was associated with, um, well, pilgrim's appearance in religious garments in public spaces of the railway, but also with perceptions of their behavior in public, right? Like how they pushed each other to get on the train and spread so uh, on the floor to have meals on the train, that sort of things. And Travel writing of the period, usually left by those with urban professional backgrounds, often made comments about these different behavioral codes that divided travelers along categories like class, gender, national belonging. 
So the question of mobility was intimately related to identity. And I used mobility to incorporate, um, to talk about all these aspects, right? So it was partly about the macro scale movement of travel and the migration, but it was also about, you know, every physical motion that people made as they moved across space, as well as um, how they gave meaning to such movement in their narration of life, which constantly sort of uh, redefined social boundaries. Um, and once we shift our analytical lens from Reza Shah's state to mobility, I think it becomes clear that the concept was central to debates and the controversies that surrounded the Trans-Iranian Railway project. Um, so questions like who gets to move, for what purposes, in what forms, in which directions, um, and what, on what spatial scales. All these questions were asked again and again by advocates of different versions of a trans-Iranian railway and their critics. So for instance, for political leaders of the early Pahlavi state, you know, mobility was a double-edged sword because it was necessary to move troops from Tehran to the provinces to control autonomous centers of power uh, that were very active at the beginning of the 1920s. Um, it was also necessary to produce a, some sort of national economy because the idea was predicated on the assumption of the smooth flow of goods across the nation. And equally importantly, mobility um, was a crucial precondition for the propagation of what official discourse called the new civilization, Tamadoni Jadid, which was um, essentially a, a sort of a way of living based on imagined European modernity. So to produce a politically, economically, and culturally coherent national space, the Pahlavi state needed to facilitate the movement of people, goods, and ideas, and particularly from Tehran to the provinces. And at the same time, however, um, state propaganda of the time expressed deep anxiety about unregulated mobility, right? So in addition to pilgrim mobility I mentioned earlier, Tribal mobility was a prime example since their perceived unreliability as a source of the long term um, labor force was seen as a hindrance to nation building. And likewise, transnational migration um, of workers raised suspicion because uh, their cross border movement could accompany the circulation of ideas like communism, labor activism, and whatnot across the Soviet Union, Iran, Iraq, and the larger uh, Persian Gulf world. And there were indeed uh, many, you know, many workers who did take advantage of the rail of mobility to connect with comrades across national boundaries. Um, so the railway project wasn't even intended to produce mobilities evenly for everybody, right? While promoting national scale movement of certain kinds, um, the goal was to regulate and transform other types of threatening mobility the kind of mobility that didn't really conform to the logic of the nation in terms of the scale of their movement, the purpose of their movement, and the way in which mobility was performed. Um, so the railway project was purported to fundamentally transform mobilities so the Iranian nation would embody these ideals of the new civilization through the bodies of citizens, but of course, it would be impossible to mold individuals, these idealized prototypes. So there's this gap between these ideals and um, reality, which kind of lead to constant tension between the logic of the nation mainly expressed in the censored Iranian press and uh, everyday practices of mobility among various groups of people. And I should also, um, also, also note that contestations exist among ordinary people's practices of mobility as well, right? And I get into this question in the two final chapters of the book. Um, so in the penultimate chapter, I discuss how railway workers had to compete with each other for the dwindling resources of the railway organization in the post-occupation period. And I specifically analyze how they integrated uh, stories of mobility in their narration of life 
and valorized national scale migration as the most worthy sacrifice for the nation to prove their worthiness compared to other workers whose sacrifices are presumably less profound and therefore they should, uh, shouldn't should receive the same kind of uh, perquisites from the railway organization, their, their employer. And in the final chapter of the book, um, I talk about how railway travelers differentiated each other based on the spatial and qualitative aspects of mobility. And in both cases, the main thing we see is that these processes of producing um, Iranians as citizens were very much differentiated by the kind of mobilities they practiced. Um, so in sum, um, I study the history of the Trans-Iranian Railway Project through these contestations from the period of infrastructural expansion in Iran's neighboring empires during the 1860s to the late 1940s. So it's shortly after the departure of the Allied forces that um, operated Iran's transport infrastructure during the occupation period in World War II. Um, and before I finish, um, I want to talk just briefly about my temporal and spatial frameworks because I'm not seeing the railway project exclusively as Reza Shah's project opened the door for me to reevaluate these frameworks, right? So a big chunk of my book is about the 1940s, uh, which is after uh, Reza Shah was forced to abdicate by the Anglo-Soviet invasion of 1941, which I find interesting because when I began to work on this project, I thought I was going to write about the Reza Shah period. And I ended up discussing the 40s a lot because as much as the Trans-Iranian Railway evolved in the Reza Shah period, it was also very much a product of the Allied occupation of Iran. Right. So in many ways, the railway project sort of acquired a path of its own after 1941 and shaped Iran's sociocultural transformations in ways that were um, unforeseen by its planners. So the rapid expansion of uh, social welfare programs um, with a special segregation of railway passengers, especially between Iranian civilians and the allied soldiers. Um, these are maybe good examples of these post uh, Reza Shah developments. And more obviously, the fact that the transport capacity of the railway increased by almost 20 times during the occupation in order to respond to the new demand to transport the US land lease materials to the Soviet Union illustrate the, the importance of the occupation period and the 40s in general. Um, so my point is that, you know, uh, social cultural historians of Iran could look at these contingent processes that unfolded uh, during the crucial decade to get a better sense of kind of longer term consequences of uh, Reza Shah era projects. And in terms of the spatial framework um, of the book, um, as I have been sort of alluding to so far, I pay much attention to the Trans-Iranian Railways um, transnational origins and consequences. Um, because once I began following mobile individuals instead of official proclamations, I realized that the lack of attention to transnational connections was perhaps one of the most serious byproducts of viewing the railway as Reza Shah's national project. Um, so for instance, the rise of the first generation of railway workers is usually associated with the establishment of technical schools by the Pahlavi state in the late 1930s. But uh, we should also keep in mind that the railway project was happening over 60 years after the rapid expansion of rail networks um, in Iran's neighboring regions like India, the Caucasus and the Ottoman Empire. And this means that the railway um, project necessarily interacted with existing infrastructural networks and with existing circulation of labor produced by them. So early railway workers had acquired industrial experience in um, Iran's neighboring empires. And there are sort of two distinct kind of um, uh, circuits of connectivity. So by using a series of workers and interviews published in the um, railway industry newspaper, I'm, I show how first generation workers were part of these circulation of labor. And one involved uh, the Northern region uh, that included the Caucasus, Russia, and Anatolia 
and particularly um, Azari's work in construction industrial sectors in this transborder region in the first few decades of the 20th century. And many of them came back to Iran once construction started in the late 20s and early 30s. And the other circuit centered around the Persian Gulf, uh, colored in yellow. And this included the, you know, the Anglo-Persian oil company where many Khuzestanis acquired their first industrial experience uh, before joining the railway in the 1930s. Um, but there are also a number of Iraqis and Indians, particularly Parsis, who came to Iran as the first generation of locomotive engineers. So, so while it is true that technical schools from the Reza Shah period produced thousands of railway workers by the late 1940s, they were actually preceded by Iranian and non-Iranian workers who migrated across borders prior to the rise of the Pahlavi state in 1925. And I wanted to think about you know, these um, connections because sometimes we think of histories of infrastructures um, in the non-West, thinking about the West as the sort of the origin of technological expertise and a non-Western place we study as the the sort of the receiving end of that expertise that tries to negotiate with Western knowledge, right? Um, which kind of reduces the relationship to uh, the histories of infrastructure to the West and a specific place in the non-West, but that wasn't really the case here, right? And in fact, um, as a infrastructure project that took place so much later than its neighbors similar projects, the Trans-Iranian Railway should be situated in a number of uh, regional contexts. Um, so this is, a, this is the sort of brief overview of what my book attempts to do and what kind of questions I wanted to address. And I look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Jafari's thoughts. Maybe I should stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Um... Thank you, uh, Mikhail. There was a, a very clear presentation, uh, but let me first uh, congratulate you again with this fantastic book. Um, I really enjoyed its content, its prose, and especially the way uh, you have brought to life uh, the experience of ordinary Iranians uh, with mobility and also uh, the railways actually as a public space. Um, I was also especially uh, impressed by the way you uh, have been able to fuse uh, histories of infrastructure and uh, uh, mobility with um, uh, uh, social and cultural histories. Uh, I think your narrative is also very multiscalar, uh, focusing on various local sites, which are refreshingly outside of uh, Tehran, I must say, mm -hmm. uh, but also connecting them to national and transnational developments and uh, mobilities. And I think you have been able to do this by actually avoiding what you explain in the introduction as methodological statism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this approaching the railway, not primarily through the state, but revealing how it emerged through interactions of state officials, foreign powers, planners, technocrats, travelers, workers, and their families. So my first question really relates to this non-state-centric approach that is fortunately, I think, gaining momentum in studies of the uh, Pahlavi era in the last uh, two decades. Um, and it is about the sources, which are, of course, themselves often written by state officials. So can you tell us a bit more about the challenges you faced in finding alternative sources or reinterpreting these state sources um, in a way to kind of retrieve uh, subaltern voices. Uh, I was, for instance, uh, intrigued by your creative use of travelogues and interviews. Um, also, again, there, uh, the uh, presence of educated middle class Iranians is very prominent. Um, so how have you been able to kind of navigate this uh, problematic of the, uh, of the sources? Yeah, um, that's a really great question because, you know, um, I think what I think what I was really struggling struggling with initially, uh, like I said er, at the during the presentation, I thought I was going to write about the the Reza Shah period, that railway project, but then I kept finding a very formulaic. Uh, praise of the project and very formulaic descriptions of what the railway was doing doing 
And I think what looking at those sources made me think about is to start sort of accumulating various different kinds of sources. I guess that's what you know every historian would do. So I, I'm using sort of multiple uh, archival sources um, from the occupation period. They, they have the US archival sources, the British archives, um, the, uh, the Danish archival sources from the consortium that supervised the construction. And then there is the, um, the Iranian uh, Majlis archives, which house many petitions from uh, residents along the route. Uh, and in addition to that, I'm, like you said, I'm using a lot of travelogues uh, and industry publications, accident reports. And sometimes um, there are very interesting details about how people are, to get a sense of how people are traveling, how people are experience, experiencing this uh, infrastructure project. <clears throat> I think one of the, uh, uh, my favorite example is um, how in, well, can I, maybe I'll speak about two examples because one is about kind of a, this empirical details that come from a accident report. Um, and that is when accidents happen, we, you accidentally hear, uh, the voices of these or experiences of uh, many passengers who would never leave their own accounts because um, uh, many of the travelers, especially pilgrims in fourth class passenger cars, they were uh, not literate, right? Um, but when accidents happen, um, I started to notice that they were overwhelming the, overwhelmingly the victims of uh, accidents. They are the ones who die. And to get a sense of, and to explain why there are so many uh, victims among fourth class passengers. A lot of reports talk about the conditions of their travel, right? The fact that they were kind of stuck in this windowless uh, freight cars and in order to create ventilation, they opened all the doors, which is of course really dangerous if you think about the terrain that you see in my virtual background. So when something wrong happens, they are all sort of fall or, um, so, these official account or archival accounts created by you know technocrats, um, sort of more senior uh, engineer engineers who investigated the accidents, can also tell stories about these um, passengers who wouldn't leave their own sources. But also another example I want to talk about is maybe uh, various petitions because sometimes workers tell in kind of a in the need to get uh, what they want out of the railway organization or sometimes from the Majlis, they would describe the sort of material, um, material difficulties they are having in extreme detail. So a lot of railway workers would talk about um, ex the experience of having to, I'm sorry? Oh, they, they talk a lot the experience of having to, you know, um, save, collect their co-workers' corpses when accidents happen. They would talk about the, the horrible taste of rationed bread and all sorts of details about their daily uh, experience of working for the railway. So I think um, it's sort of a very mundane practice of what many historians would do of collecting various kinds of sources and reading them in, in different in detail how they experienced the time period. So that's, I think, how I started to construct, um, reconstruct uh, various everyday experiences. Oh, absolutely, and I was really uh, uh, fascinated by your use of petitions and also how they uh, change in terms of language, right? Before, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the late 1930s and then in the, in the, in the 40s, and, and, and you very well described that. Um, I have a second question that is more conceptual. Uh, because you rightly emphasize how the rail uh, way not merely increased mobility, but also interrupted um, and redirected and reorganized mobility. So the result was really unevenness because not everybody moved at this uh, uh, same pace and some people moved and uh, some regions were left out and so on. Um, but I think 
your book also shows how the railway facilitated the emergence of hybrid cultural and social practices and, and, and values. Uh, for instance, one could be a Shia pilgrim and uh, a tourist in a kind of a modern uh, sense to the chagrin of both traditionalists and the advocates of this new civilization that you, uh, that you describe. So um, I think there was not merely kind of a clash between these kind of uh, binary positions, but within that public space of the, of, the, of the railways, this was this kind of fusion and creation of amalgamate kind of identities and so on, which, which is in there, but I don't think you have really made that more explicit. So I wanted to kind of see if you agree with that, that it is not merely kind of, uh, kind of traveling together of these different identities, but the kind of a fusion of, of, of new identities, uh, which in my own work, I call more kind of uneven and combined development because of exactly this uh, combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are absolutely right that um, that's one of the things I was getting at, but uh, you are also absolutely right that I don't quite make that as explicit as I could have um, been, um, partly because the idea sort of came to me in a clear way towards the very end of the process while I was writing uh, the last portions, rewriting the last portions of the manuscript. But um, so, like you mentioned, it's you know, what I see in many um, studies of the early Pahlavi period, the Reza Shah period, we tend to talk about the new middle class, you know, the, the modern middle class, the urban professional backgrounds. Um, and I struggled this with this myself too, but we tend to sort of imagine there is this kind of a very homogeneous group uh, that doesn't interact or overlap with any other categories, right? Um, so. But when you start thinking about it, um, many of these middle-class uh, people who are thinking about uh, performing pilgrimage, uh, going to national historical sites are also performing pilgrimage. And, and so these categories I talk about, pilgrim, tourist, um, they may appear as separate individuals, but there's so much overlap in the two. And that goes for, um, the another, other example that you raised about uh, pilgrim versus uh, potential sort of communist activist, right? Because right. there is a, the fact that one is going to Najaf and Karabala for the explicit purpose of performing pilgrimage doesn't necessarily preclude all other elements. Um, he could be or she uh, transporting, smuggling various uh, revolutionary leaflets uh, or could be also visiting various national sites along the way. So these sort of complexities of individual identities um, is one of the things uh, that I think I want to sort of state more explicitly now that the book is out yet. No, that would be great. I mean, I would definitely invite you to kind of kind of develop that idea. I think that would mm -hmm. be an excellent kind of addition to this. Uh, I have really a, a last a final uh, question before we move to the questions of the uh, of the audience. Um, given my own work on the oil industry, I wasn't surprised by um, your description of the parallel development of the oil industry and the, and, the, and the railway and the multiple ways in which they actually interacted, right? Through, for instance, labor mobility, kind of people starting to work in the oil industry and then moving to the uh, uh, railways. In the case of the oil industry, uh, we witnessed a very particular process of class formation of the of the of the workforce uh, through the creation of kind of common urban spaces common identities uh, cultural dispositions um, uh, activism uh, repertoires of activism and so on so my question is could we speak on in those terms about the labor force in the uh, railway as well kind of the fact that they that they reproduce themselves culturally, and, and socially, so in terms of a, of a, of a group uh, in, the, in the 30s, 40s, and, and maybe after, or was the railways, because of its kind of fragmented nature geographically, did it kind of prevent that kind of uh, class formation uh, process? Um, I would say I see more parallels to the oil industry um, because, so I, one major difference, well, there are several major differences. One is the clear 
geographically scattered nature of the railway workforce, right? Unlike the oil workforce, which concentrated in Khuzestan, uh, there are uh, many small railway communities across the railway route. So uh, even relatively large uh, provincial stations like Andimesh, Karak, the scale of workers in that particular location was relatively small. And that is reflected in various, you know, uh, clubs uh, or salons that employers provided uh, because in many of the provincial cities, the scale of those uh, perquisites was pretty small. Um, but at the same time, I think the railway workers, it seems like moving across the railway route, you know, it's part of the job to, or for, if you're there, the railway crew, they, it's part of the job to move around, but this moving around the railway route seems to have been kind of ingrained in the way they organized, because we see instances of uh, workers uh, traveling long distances, uh, sometimes just within the railway route in Iran, but also even beyond, right? I think right. I talk about the railway workers going to the Soviet Union or to Iraq and Kuwait, uh, for the purpose of organizing, right? So that despite the spatially scattered nature of the railway workers, I think they were oftentimes managing to uh, move around and organize in similar ways as oil workers. And uh, that also has to do with the kind of activities that railway organization was offering because they're offering a lot of national, national sporting competitions, national excursions, right? So railway workers, regardless of the specific regional division or the line of work they had, they were oftentimes interacting with each other. Um, yeah, so I, and yeah. combined with the, you know, what you mentioned earlier about this uh, mobility of workers from the oil industry to the railway industry and back, back and forth, I think we can draw more parallels between the two industries. And I think that that's one of the things um, um, that could be explored farther, especially if, you know, for those of, uh, if you, uh, those of you who work closely with the BP archives and um, the oil industry, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, thank you. There is actually a related question to this uh, from Dr. James Gustafson. Um, he wonders if um, this kind of interaction between these two massive industries, the oil industry and the railways, can be found in other places as well. Have you seen this kind of interactions in other countries, if I understand the question well, that's um, what is oh, it? You mean the interaction between the oil industry and other and and the, yes, industries. and the railway uh, in particular. Um, whether we have, uh, I think in in the in the Russian Empire, like in Azerbaijan, Baku, definitely uh, that was the case because in many countries, right, um, uh, all producing countries at least. Uh, uh, the oil industry and the railways are state projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine because of the nature of their uh, labor, uh, the technological kind of skilled uh, labor demand that there must have been lots of uh, connections in different countries as well. Did you come across any examples? Um, the question? Yeah, I didn't quite have any specific examples that speak to um, speak to these connections between the oil industry right. and the railway industry. But yeah, it's something <clears throat> only something yeah to explore. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um moving to uh, to other questions that are kind of uh related uh from I think uh Turkama, he's asking if um uh, the development of the railway was a precondition for the development of the national economy. So basically the connection of the railway to more generally the uh, economic developments during uh, Reza Shah's period, which accelerated, as you mentioned, in the in the 1930s. And uh, I think a related question is also from Dr. Amin Moradam um, regarding um, the relationship to the state, although it's kind of the state is in the background in your study. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. if um, actually the, the, the kind of uh, increasing pace of mobility or the changing nature of mobility also changed the nature of the state. So what is really the 
uh, kind of interaction between the state and the railway uh, in this uh, in this period. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in if I understood the first question correctly, so it is sort of asking about how the railway project produced a national economy, right. how, what kind of role it, and I, I think when it comes to the in, you know the contribution of the railway project itself to economy, I'm uh, sort of agreeing with the uh, article uh, knitting the Iranian nation in the sense that the rail infrastructure, uh, despite its symbolic significance, surprisingly had little impact, I think, uh, in terms of connecting the national economy. Right? And I, I think that has so much to do. And it, so the national economy as an ideal was so often talked about in the popular press you know, that was one of the main justifications for building the railway, uh, connecting the capital to the two bodies of water for creating an export oriented economy. Um, but at the same time, um, we know that the railway didn't quite go through many industrial centers of the country at the time. It was sort of, the railway was created and along the line, uh, there was attempt, sort of limited attempts at creating factories, like, so I wouldn't say the railway um, sort of empirically contributed to creating the unifying sort of different uh, economic activities across the nation. But I think in terms of creating the sense that it has to happen, it was much more important. So it was more, much more important rhetorically than the actual function of the railway after it opened. I mean, we're talking about you know, a railway, a train running uh, once a day, at least until 1941. It's a very limited uh, scale of transport capacity, at least before 1941. Um, and how does this relate to the second question of actually the role of the state, both mm -hmm. in terms of intervening in this project, like building the railway, but also the impact that uh, the, the railway infrastructures and the kind of mobilities it created maybe had on the state, uh, for instance, uh, uh, enabling migration. You, you, you give examples of how um, the migration between Iraq and uh, Iran, kind of Khoramshar and, 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 and Basra kind of changed the kind of uh, the state's um, uh, processing of visa applications uh, that mm -hmm. comes to mind uh, to me uh, in, in, in that process. Were there kind of uh, more of these uh, tools and mechanisms that kind of maybe increase state capacity, for instance, in controlling its, its borders, right? Or intervening in the inter, uh, internal migration uh, uh, processes. So can we see actually this interaction between the state and the railways as well? Uh, absolutely. So, and I think it's important to keep in mind how fragmented these policies were. That's one of the things I kept uh, uh, coming back in different parts of the book. Uh, one example is the visa application policy, right? On the one hand, the railway organization is asking people not to, not to travel, uh, asking the foreign ministry not to issue visa, uh, but then they keep selling fourth class tickets to passengers. So passengers go there anyway. And then they, these fourth pass class passengers get stuck at Khoram Shah for quite a long time. Knowing, not knowing what to do. And then the foreign ministry is still, you know, not quite issuing the passports. Uh, and and um, the Iraqi uh, consulate in Khoram Shah decides to issue some uh, visas to Iranian citizens. But I think the overall kind of thing we are seeing in the case of this uh, visa application process in Khuzestan is that um, there were so many kind of incongruent policies pursued by different state institutions. And in this case, people get stuck in Khuram Shah and a, a lot of them just uh, smuggled themselves across the borders, right? right? And I think that happens in situations like um, Andy Mesh, early years of railway operations when um, the goal was to make Andy Mesh as the transport hub because that was the temporary terminus of the railway. Um, so from Ahvaz to Andy Mesh, uh, 
the idea was to use the railway instead of trucks. And in order to make that happen, the state tries to ban the use of highways um, by truck drivers and order them to move to Andy Mesh. But Andy Mesh doesn't have storage facilities. And the military is commandeering many trucks uh, for campaigns against tribes, right? So if you truck drivers go to Andy Mesh, the trucks will be confiscated. And so nobody wants to use that station. So there are so many different ways state institutions are acting. So in the overall sense, I do think there is an increasing state capacity to uh, you know, create the flows of movement, but at the same time, it's not some sort of um, the state uh, acting to make that happen in a smooth way. There's so many problems in every step of creating the flow. Yes. Thank you for that. There is a final question here from the audience I want to pose to you, and it's um, related to whether uh, the railways actually contributed to the emergence of more anxiety among both the population and uh, intellectuals and the elite about uh, modern technologies. Um, and uh, let me get the question straight. Yes, so whether intellectuals, travelers, uh, and workers kind of develop more um, anxious uh, 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 attitude towards technology. Uh, and I'm thinking also of aspects of your book where you're writing about both the incidents that were happening, um, but also during the occupation, obviously, um, uh, the, the military was using the, the railways more often than ordinary Iranians were using. So this could have all kind of created, because in the beginning there was much enthusiasm, right? For the for the technology it was seen as a civilizing project, as, as, as progress, but obviously it also brought incidents with it. It also disrupted mobilities and it created all kind of problems and not everybody could travel with it. So was there a contradiction in terms of experiencing this uh, progress versus anxiety about the uh, project? Um, I think, I mean, those two, you know, the dreaming of this high-speed movement and anxieties of high-speed movement kind of went hand in hand, right? Because um, what we see in the early Pahlavi area period is with the coming of automobiles and with the coming of the railway, there is an increasing theoretical potential to achieve high, high speed movement. So there isn't so much excitement about it because that, again, it relates to all sorts of you know, ideas of unifying the nation. But at the same time, what people quickly start to realize is that it's not quite happening. It should, technologically, if everything works perfectly, it could happen, but at the same time, given the complexity of the infrastructure, the infrastructural system, there's always a glitch somewhere. And um, there are worse, numerous accidents. There were many disruptions of movement because of you know, natural disasters or a lack of maintenance, lack of expertise, all those of factors. Um, so these two kind of constantly develop uh, in conversation with each other, right? And I think that, um, becomes important when we think of these uh, increasing attempts from a more technocratic elites to try to, uh, in their attempts to produce kind of safe, steady, uh, speedy movement. Uh, and essentially what, what's interesting here is that they don't quite blame the technology itself. They're still saying, well, technology should function if it is operated properly. And who gets the blame? And it's the workers, workers who are not performing uh, their job properly, not using the correct form of uh, micro motions, right? They would be deviating from all sorts of uh, rules, regulations created by technocrats so that the yeah. movement is created smoothly. But workers, of course, they, had, they have their own reasons to um, not follow these regulations. So again, what we see is even ideas like creating um, uh, movement steadily using this supposedly uh, theoretically perfect technology would create so much contestations over different groups, uh, in this case, technocrats and workers particularly. Right. Um, we have time for one final question. So if you want to also be short in your uh, uh, answer, 
Um, and it, again, it's kind of about this uh, 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 contradiction, basically, of uh, Reza Shah wanting to centralize the state and the nation, right? Um, but the railway obviously also decentralizes it uh, because it creates movements from the south to the to the north. And uh, um, in the book, you also describe how kind of in the early stages, uh, many intellectuals and state officials thinking of the uh, railway was very Tehran centric, right? It, it, it was all about Tehran, but as it developed, it obviously connected these uh, uh, peripheries of, of, of Iran and Iran through Tehran. So um, do, do you see a contradiction there or was actually this centralization a precondition of being able to kind of create such a project that kind of connects uh, the peripheries of, uh, of Iran? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I don't necessarily see them as contradictions, right? Because we are looking at how different parts of Iran are being integrated into larger kind of network, infrastructural networks of movement. And if we think about the way, you know, these, the kind of identities I talk about in the book were formed, the fact that people uh, experienced movement in the peripheries, crossing of the national borders, connecting with people outside Iran, um, there is a possibility of them identifying with, you know, uh, more transnational communities, but it doesn't necessarily curtail um, this creation of the nation. And in fact, I think you could make an argument that um, the creation of the nation among these Iranians who travel across, it was essential for them to interact in these borderlands and outside Iran. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's clear. Um, our time is up, unfortunately. It is almost uh, one. Uh, I just really want to thank you again for this uh, clear presentation. And uh, again, recommend the book for uh, everyone. Oh, it's uh, not very visible <laughs> at this. Um, uh, because, I mean, if you're interested in infrastructural history, but also social and cultural histories of late Bajar and early Pahlavi era, this is uh, definitely a recommendation. Um, also thanking the audience for their questions and their time, and hope to see everyone again next week uh, during our uh, seminars. Thank you again, uh, Mikia. I'm Thank you so much. Have a nice day.